Hello and welcome everyone to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Joan Lima and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you so much for tuning in for our latest virtual CEO roundtable. If you have any questions about upcoming roundtables, whatever it may be, such as how to register or how to participate, feel free to reach out to us through our website at jsa.net. And by the way, just as a reminder to put in our calendar, our next virtual roundtable will cover shaking down the digital divide, rural broadband access across America. And that will take place on April the 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. But without further delay, let's get started. Our topic today is rising above, above COVID-19, the latest developments in hybrid cloud applications. The COVID-19 pandemic cap- catapulted our industry into a rapid period of development and technological advancement to support entire workforces and classrooms online. This new normal has had a profound impact on the adoption of hybrid cloud and the overall development and advancement of cloud applications. During this session, we will discuss those developments and how our industry has come together to persevere. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you our exceptional executive lineup who weigh in on the topic. And joining us today, we have Brian Bean, Executive Vice President of Product and Technical Services at Thrive, Joel Osman, Managing Director of Digital Experience and Design at Maven Wave, Ryan Schultz, Enterprise Architect at Involta, Phil Kenny, CEO of Infinite, and Harish Jayakuma, Global Leads of Applications Modernization Solution Management at Google Cloud. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's start by giving a quick introduction of who you are and what you do. And also, with that, can you give us your biggest lesson learned during lockdown? Ryan, do you want to go ahead? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Joe. Ryan Schultz, uh, Enterprise Architect with Envolta. We're a hybrid IT, cloud services, and consulting firm. Uh, The biggest lesson I think I've learned uh, throughout the pandemic is that uh, no matter the age, the ability to to adapt to technology has been amazing. And that's just something that surprised me, whether young with school or older, um, doesn't really matter. The the adaptation has been amazing. Hmm been definitely a quite a time. Um, Harish, do you want to tell us um, what you do a little bit more about what you do and one of the lessons you've learned over the last 12 months? Sure. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Harish Jai Kumar. <clears throat> I lead the application modernization uh, solutions team here at Google. Um, my uh, biggest lesson learned if I may, over your piece in this past year uh, has been with COVID is uh, I was actually surprised how many more customer meetings and customers I could actually uh, speak to and learn about without hopping on a flight. Uh, I used to travel so much, you know, I spent so much time just for like a couple of hours of meeting. Yes, I miss the, um, I miss the, uh, you know, in-person uh, networks, but I was able to get much more customer meetings done for different time zones uh, just over a, a conference call. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I think post COVID will be much more. Um, we'll be looking much more into what events we're actually going to go to and what trips we're going to take for work. Uh, but thank you, Harish. And then Joel. Sure, Joel. Joel Osman. Uh, I'm with Maven Wave. We are a uh, cloud infrastructure development and consulting firm. Uh, I actually lead our user experience, what we call experience design practice, as well as our custom cloud application development. So. We've been working with clients across a number of different industries on a number of different projects uh, in and around uh, both pre and post pandemic. And what I can say I've learned in the last 12 months is that, uh, you know, I've seen that that companies, IT operations can adjust working models, similar to what Ryan said. And we had a lot of clients that previously had required in-person, on-site scrum teams, uh, needed, you know, the right business and technology people there in person. We always had more of a virtual model that we espoused, but many of them said, well, that'll never work here. And I've, they've been able to see, sometimes with a bit of our help, that you know it can be done. And, and that flexibility, to echo what Ryan said, I think it's been uh, interesting to see the adjustments that have been made uh, you know, with, with different companies and different models to, to make it work. Yeah, I mean, in a way, this has pushed us to think outside the box, um, I believe, of new models. Um, that's very interesting. But, well, thank you, Joel. And then, Brian? Thanks, Joe. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, My name is Ryan Bean. I'm the EVP of Product and Technical Services at Thrive. Uh, Thrive is a managed services provider, uh, and we're focused on next-generation managed services, including hybrid cloud, cybersecurity, 
uh, disaster recovery and professional services that enable uh, digital transformation. Um, I think the biggest lesson I've learned is that you know, organizations that can easily adapt to change have really had minimal impact related to the lockdowns and any of the COVID related restrictions. You know, companies that have adopted cloud prior to the pandemic uh, were far less impacted by a remote workforce compared to the organizations that were still you know, heavily relying on internal systems that had limited access uh, to those systems outside of the walls of the office. Hmm. Super interesting. Thank you, Brian. Um, but let's crack on. And just for the sake of uh, making sure we're all on the same page here, um, shall we define what hybrid cloud is to begin with? Um, maybe Harish, do you want to go first? Sure, happy to. So, I mean, if you actually break it down, hybrid in its true sense is more than one, right? There's a mixture. So that's the same thing that you apply uh, when you talk about specifically hybrid cloud. Um, so basically, it's, it's a mixture of for customers who have some amount of presence still, say, on-premise in their own data center and some parts of it in a public cloud. That's why it's private and public together is typically what you call as a combination, which is a hybrid cloud. So it could be either Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, any of the public clouds, as well as you have your uh, some of the workloads or your applications still in the private cloud. And I know private cloud meaning inside your data center, uh, something that's just kept for your internal customers as well. Now the reason could be a bunch of things. One, because, sorry, I mean internal as in like your basic customers. The reasons could be a couple of things. One could be like, listen, you have some, uh, you know, you could a financial customer, you don't want to put your data in the cloud, so you need to keep your data still on-prem, could be a reason. Or maybe you're in a journey. So for example, um, as an application modernization lead, I work with a bunch of customers who talk about um, modernizing and getting to the cloud. And that's not going to happen overnight. So there's going to be that time frame over which you need some pieces that are going to be still on-prem and some pieces which are still going to be in the cloud. So during that time frame, it could, you could still need to have a hybrid cloud methodology as well. So that's how I would uh, clarify what hybrid cloud is. Hmm. I mean, that's interesting. I think that kind of sums up well what hybrid cloud is. Um, unless anyone has anything that you want to add, maybe Brian, would you like to drop yeah. that? Yeah, I think one key component, um, you know, this this is a difference between multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, right? Multi-cloud is having workloads that reside in, in different clouds, whether they're on-prem clouds, private cloud, public cloud, um, but the orchestration layer um, that manages all of those and the interaction between those different platforms is, you know, really a key component, uh, you know, in my mind for hybrid cloud. 100%. And uh, spot on, Brian. Um, and we're also having, I mean, in fact, a lot of my conversations today are multi-cloud. Uh, like I've been doing it for quite some time before this. I was at Docker and then EMC we're talking about these kind of uh, cloud journeys. And at that time, we were talking about multi-cloud as like, hey, something that could happen. And now it's reality. Most of the customers who start the cloud journey are, are either uh, the, I would say, the mature crowd, uh, if I may. Or, or, or most of them are looking at a multi-cloud strategy and they want one orchestration layer across these clouds and how do they do that? So the good difference, like what Brian said, multi-cloud versus hybrid. Hmm. No, that, that's, that's good to point out because um, sometimes there is a bit of confusion out there. Um, okay, well, thank you guys. But then let's crack on now into the main topic of the panel. There's been a lot of things happening over the last 12 months with COVID. Um, COVID has really impacted cloud adoption uh, from what we've seen, and that goes from anything related to cloud services, the way they are provisioned, um, cost models, um, startup usage of clouds. I mean, how has cloud, how has COVID-19 really changed hybrid cloud applications? Um, and has the industry managed the demand correctly, in your opinion, um, Joel? Yeah, thanks, Shao. Certainly, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, obviously, an uptick in the adoption of remote work and collaboration tools. Uh, we do a lot of implementation and change management services around, uh, you know, Google Workspace, which used to be called G Suite, and, and other tools like it. So everyone across all industries is certainly taking the opportunity to accelerate uh, remote collaborate, cloud-based collaboration work. So we're seeing that. On the cloud-based development front, you know, you see different things in different industries from the pandemic. I mean, we've certain seen slowdown into certain project initiatives, mainly due to uncertain revenue or budget cycles. You know, things put on hold while we, we, we try to work our way through uh, some of the pandemic-related issues. But 
We've also seen spikes uh, in other industries in certain solutions. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, telehealth. We've, we've been doing a lot, and I'm sure others are accelerating plans around telehealth and some of the relaxing of some of the government restrictions regarding you know, access to telehealth has really moved up the timeframes, if you will, of a lot of healthcare providers and other you know, specialists there in terms of how they're going to be provide technology-driven telehealth and telehealth-related solutions. We've also seen a lot in stake and local government. Uh, you know, they're, they're all wrestling with, uh, you know, whether it's unemployment systems or getting people back to work. There's a number of, uh, you know, opportunities where the, the rapid development cycles that you associated with cloud development uh, you know, really lend themselves to, you know, these type of, of tactical emergency projects that a lot of state and local governments are trying to, to come on board. And then lastly, just we've seen some e-commerce, right? Everyone's starting to figure out how are they going to, you know, digitally transform their business. And while, you know, it was something that, you know, I would say almost every company was looking at pre-pandemic, it, it's very much accelerated. You know, if we hadn't gone digital, if we hadn't looked to be flexible and utilize cloud computing to do more in this time frame, we certainly are looking at it now because it's not so much for competitive advantage. It's, it's you know, it's for, it's for staying alive and serving our customers you know, where they're at. Uh, you know, so like I said, it, it, there's been some ups and downs, if you will, relative to different industries, different types of solutions. But I would say there's just been a generally accelerated pace towards this digitization, if you will, of how businesses get run. And that lends itself to the flexibility that come with hybrid and multi-cloud solutions. So it's almost like the story in our mind has been accelerated and, and cranked up at a relative rapid pace, uh, more around business survival than around competitive advantage. Although, you know, those advantages are still there, right? Long term, the investments we're seeing around these solutions are certainly going to pay off long term. But there's been an urgency uh, that I think, you know, the, from a business standpoint, the pandemic has certainly accelerated for a lot of the clients that we talk to in, in those particular industries where it's most relevant. I mean, that's very interesting. There's a recent uh, McKinsey study as well that really shows that adoption and, or digitalization of services and consumption of digital services um, has speeded up by about three to seven years. Um, yep. So, I mean, in the space of 12 months, we've gone into the future. We are in 2028 now when it comes to digital. Um, but, Ryan, would you, would you like to add anything else to what uh, George said? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that, that we've seen uh, out in the industry is <clears throat> that you have those those organizations that have been extremely focused on the customer. They've been looking at the customer. They've been, you know, making all the improvements they can for the customer, but they haven't looked necessarily introspectively at their organization. How could they improve process? How can they reduce cost? Um, those kinds of things. So I think the pandemic has also helped to to bring that visibility to the inside of inside for organizations to help them really understand that you know the the impact to their revenue and impact to their costs can be significantly changed by things that they've done internally it's not always just an outward focused um approach with the customer base don't get me wrong it's a it's still a an 80 20 kind of approach right with any kind of organization that's that's selling a product or, or getting services out to their customer base but you have to look introspectively to see am i doing the right thing am i needing to shift my technology to another place do i need to take a different approach than what we've done for the last 80 years that we've been successful and i think it's really taken some folks that have been really successful for a really long time and knocked them on their ear retail industry is a prime example you know building more and more and more stores amazing great wonderful um, but then you realize if nobody's going to the stores, uh, it, that accelerates your, your, uh, failure, uh, in those, those instances. So being able to make that ad adaptation and then take some, some of that internal focus on how to think different has been, uh, something that's, that I've seen more and more of my customer base doing. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to play thunder on what, what Joel and Ryan said, uh, we're having the same, I mean, if, if at all anything, it's just accelerated everything the movement to the cloud or and most of the time like i think even recently last week i was having a um, conversation with the cio where it's about completely reducing cost and they're like what they had planned to accelerate to the cloud in three years now they want to do this in like six months <laughs> so that's the kind of fast time frame they're actually trying to see if they can jump and go to and i also wanted to kind of highlight just like i think ryan brought up about the retail pieces right like people are no longer going to the store and suddenly now they are like okay curbside picking um and these retail teams, they didn't even have that kind of uh, facility. So they, they quickly wanted to go, how do I do that? Like, 
uh, spin up a mobile app, get that ready, spin up on serverless, completely managed. They're like all that was, is done in like a couple of weeks. They wanted like their first feature to be so that because they still need to stay in the business, right? So those kinds of conversations are are are, are really really um, starting to happen with a lot of our customers as well. That's just interesting, and it goes in line with what um, Joel and Ryan also said. Um, but that's just interesting. Let's move on to the next question that we've got. Um, and let's talk about the, the biggest single development in, hybrid, in the hybrid cloud space over the last 12 months. Um, I think we've got Phil back, so let's try and get Phil. Yeah. Up. Oh, here we go. Go yeah, ahead. Can hear also, me. Tell you, no, no worries. Also, tell, you wouldn't be a webinar without a glitch. Also, <laughs> tell what's what's been your biggest lesson over the last 12 months in addition to what's the biggest development um, in hybrid cloud. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I apologize for the uh, inconvenience here. Um, yeah, our biggest lesson in the in the last twelve months that we've seen uh, and that I've seen uh, has been the proliferation of application by application management that's needed. Uh, people are moving very quickly. Uh, Harish mentioned the pickup at, uh, curbside pickup. People are building applications very quickly, and they need hardware, they need infrastructure, and network connectivity, and they need access to the to the systems to be able to do that. Um, the biggest challenge that we've seen for people uh, relates to, again, back to the commentary about retail, and you see it in the doc, in doctor's offices and things like that, is now everything's done from home. And how do you create, how does a an end user within an enterprise have a consolidated view of applications and still secure view of those applications uh, while the IT team and the and the team in the company is trying to manage those application by application and still adjusting, and you know being able to provide consistent access to for businesses to private cloud, public cloud applications, and in-house applications that they need to run their business but do it remotely, puts a big burden on security, uh, puts a big burden on the end user, and also puts a big burden on network uh, connectivity that is needed now to manage a remote workforce. I mean, everyone working from home obviously is going to create a lot more chances for, for people to do what they shouldn't. Um, what would you say has been the biggest development uh, that the pandemic has driven um, in terms of security development around cloud? Um, Brian, would you like to take that one? Yes. Uh, so I really can't say that um, you know any of those hyper uh, cloud security changes or development have been driven you know specifically by the pandemic. Um, but we are starting to see an increased focus uh, from, from customers around cloud workload protection and uh, CASB or cloud access security broker services. You know, traditional security is basically focused on the network perimeter and end users. And you know, as companies transition to, to hybrid cloud, it becomes a little more difficult to uh, enforce security um, without additional tools that, that help them do that. So uh, public cloud, so, you know, they have good security monitoring tools, but uh, in general, they're typically specific to their platform. So as you move into a multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environment, you need tools that can look across uh, the expanse of where those workloads reside and, and be able to collect logs and, and generate alerts, uh, identify where there may be excessive permissions granted, misconfigurations and other public exposures. Um, all of these things that attack, that uh, increase the attack surface. So. We're seeing demand for tools like, you know, SIM, uh, security information event management, um, and cloud workspace protection, um, and then cloud access security broker, which you know sits between the, the end user and the cloud platforms to to enforce those uh, the cloud access and the security policies that extend beyond you know the traditional network. What would you say? Just quick. What would you say is the biggest? mistake that sometimes enterprises make when it comes to their cybersecurity strategy um, around clouds? I think it's lack of um, lack of enforcement of security policies that they would typically uh, have within a, you know, within the traditional uh, network environment. So um, as you get, um, you know, you expand into the cloud and, and users have uh, access into those, Workloads. There may be uh, specific permissions that need to be uh, granted uh, versus allowing all users to access, um, you know, everything that's in the cloud. Uh, when you have shadow IT that's creating their own uh, cloud instances without really the knowledge of the security team, that can also open up exposure. Um, so it's really 
having a comprehensive uh, security policy around cloud um, and, uh, and, and putting the tools in place that allow you visibility uh, into, those, uh, into those cloud platforms and the workloads uh, and being able to manage that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I haven't heard Shadow IT in a long time. <laughs> um, Ryan, I know you're quite strong when it comes to cybersecurity as well, and we will go through some more of the panelists as well to talk about security. Um, what would you say has been the biggest development uh, around security? So I think just more of the focus on that end user has occurred. You know, you'll you'll always have tools, you'll always have greater tools, better tools, but at the end of the day, your your least common denominator is the human that's that's uh, sitting behind the keyboard. So as we've looked at more and more um, adoption of remote access, remote workforce, um, we've had to kind of counsel customers through moving their their posture from just focusing on their tiny block, their tiny data center and really starting to take more into account the end user that kind of has gotten forgotten uh, along the way, whether it's through training and education or it's moving the things that they consume to cloud-based services um, like Google Workspaces or O365. Um, but then you also look at um, the education space. You look at schools, you know, how they've, I've been impressed with how we've been able to rapidly adjust and adapt to giving an eight-year-old a laptop and taking home and they have to remember now usernames and passwords and be more concerned about security and, and really making changes there. So I think some of the biggest shifts that I've seen, you know, the tools have, tools have gotten better, but our education levels have increased significantly across the board uh, for all the consumers in the space. Um, it's, it's been, again, back to my original comment when we started, super impressive at the adaptation capabilities that, that I've seen across the organization or across the uh, mm. the. It's probably one of the few positive things <laughs> coming out of everything that we're living. Um, and then Harish, um, I mean, Google is huge when it comes to, to security and then, of course, um, uh, remote working in class, online classrooms. Um, tell us what you think. Yeah, I mean, um, I just want to, again, uh, and I think all the speakers are spot on. My thoughts are just resonating with the same thing. Right? We're starting to hear more the shift left security, if you, if you may, the more and more towards, you know, when you're starting to build these applications, people, it's... Uh, we've taken a step back and looked at it holistically rather than like, let me think of security as this add-on that I need to do after I've done everything, right? It's, it's always been that, uh, it's always been that I think somebody tweeted yesterday and I really liked what they actually said about this is like, we need to move away from thinking about adding security to being like, it just being as part of you building your application. So we're seeing more and more conversations when you go on the developer side is this whole concept of shift left security on like how can i add security and compliance as i'm writing my application itself without even having to think about it because that's the only way to get that tight lock um good security um over there right and uh, as you rightly said google is like super super uh <laughs> takes takes this very very seriously so like even for us you know having to go inside an office those are the kind of changes I'm seeing. Like, uh, I'm actually really, really impressed with how how we, as humans, we've adopted to all these changes. It's just, it's just amazing. Maybe it was a change in the waiting. <laughs> I mean, you see so many countries now adopting the four day week. Uh, but I think the point that you make about how do you onboard new staff um, during COVID, that's quite interesting from a security perspective. That's probably like a whole different um, round table, but that's very, very interesting. Uh, and Phil, would you like to add anything to the security chat? Yeah, I think the, the big thing that we see, uh, similar to what everybody's saying, is security is now part of the fabric of an operation. It's not just uh, a side add-on to what you're doing. It's now part of the fabric of every operation. And the conversations we're having with our customers is that security should be part of the fabric of your being now, uh, given all the accessibility that people could have. And you think about your home network, and you think about all the devices connected to your home network, and now that network is connecting to the enterprise uh, through hybrid cloud or through, uh, you know, private cloud or public cloud or even into someone's uh, local network. So the security is becoming part of the fabric of the way people operate uh, along with trying to provide those proper business applications. Hmm. Um, anyone else would like to add anything else on the security front? I guess that's enough security for COVID. <laughs> uh, I mean, the next thing I would like to talk about, and we kind of already touched on it, um, it's around cloud verticalization. Uh, I mean, this is not something new or exclusive to COVID. I guess COVID has just speeded up the development of such clouds. Um, so we are talking about clouds, for example, for financial services, e-health, as you guys mentioned, 
e-commerce gaming, which is a huge new vertical, not new, but a huge vertical, um, developing even sub verticals within itself. Um, I mean, how do things have thing, how have things changed over the last twelve months um, around cloud verticalization? And maybe Phil, let me come back to you on that one. Sorry, Harish. Sorry. Um, oh, the, the vertical solutions, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, you know, um, I think I just want to maybe highlight some of the things that the folks before me talked about each of this is, right? For example, I, I let's take the retail pieces that I talked about, you know, uh, the pickup on the curbside, that was a huge thing. Um, on the healthcare side, right? Um, again, because we have our own uh, video conferencing, Google, um, uh, conferencing solution, a lot of the, how do we actually make sure that we help the, the, both the patient side and the doctor side and really connect using our video conferencing? That's been huge, huge um, over the last year. And we've actually taken it up a notch. It's not only just about these virtual visits that you can just do, but also how can we make sure that most of these medical services are actually available to both the patients and the doctors? Well, the ability for a doctor to be able to easily collect the information about the patient securely and their symptoms and also put them in a medical record also securely so that and they can try to monitor the patient over time. And uh, now this is this is one thing which has always been something that requires like you have to go to the office, wait there, wait in first room for 30 minutes, then go to the next room and wait for 30 minutes and then you go to it. So a lot of positive feedback as well uh, in terms of how they've been able to do that. And then if I was to talk on the government side, as most of you know recently, how the employment benefits in, in NYC, um, you know, it, that the systems were like old legacy mainframe systems. Um, so we worked with a bunch of them over, I think like it was around two weeks and over weekends and how they were able to quickly ensure that all the people are actually getting their employment benefits as well. So you see in each vertical, there's like strong innovation that's happening, that's that's being driven. Um, and yeah, so that's where, those are the things that I've been seeing um, that's been happening over this. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. I think maybe um, there's also been more understanding on how to use um, to different clouds and even how you power different services. I mean, in Europe, one thing that we've experienced a lot was the rationalization, um, rationing of cloud services and bandwidth to make sure that uh, the services could cope. So, for example, I think even Google um, and Netflix, you reduce traffic by about 25% um, so the healthcare services could have enough bandwidth um, to carry on. So I think verticalization is a huge topic. Um, Joel, would you like to, to add something? Yeah, I was going to say too around compliance and reporting, and you know there are certain attributes. You, know, you look at the flexibility of cloud-based solutions, and it's terrific, right? You can do almost anything in a ridiculously shorter period of time than you would on-prem. But what ends up happening is, well, wait a minute, I need, for example, HIPAA compliance in the healthcare space, or I have very specific reporting needs in the government or financial services space, or I need to be doing consent monitoring back to healthcare again. So there are very verticalized solutions that. You could build, if you will, on top of core cloud components, but as the, the cloud providers move their way up these vertical stacks, you're seeing more and more vertical type solutions. I mean, we're talking about Google. Google has a healthcare API that is specifically focused on how I set up consent and manage data. Uh, we're doing a lot with chat and voice bot development. And you know, is, is your chat bot development tool HIPAA compliant? So what we're starting to see is, is a, a march up the stack, if you will, in that it's not just about virtual VMs and bandwidth. It's now, can I really bring these verticalized specific solutions and bring pieces of, uh, you know, out of the cloud that are whether serverless or server-based that have more of the core functionality that I need um, from a compliance and reporting standpoint, then I can just put my differentiation on top of it. So we're seeing that. I think all of the cloud providers, everyone's running to see if they can do that and, and you know, raise the stakes in the stack, if you will. And I think that's a really good point that you raise, um, especially around cloud compliance. Uh, Phil, would you like to, to go next and give us your yeah, we, um, we also see, uh, similar to what Joel was just saying, we're seeing a lot of people move applications to uh, you know, various cloud, uh, with their various cloud needs, whether it be private cloud or public cloud, or sitting behind, again, sitting behind their firewall. and. Things like we see uh, in the healthcare space, some of our customers are putting images in, in, a, um, in a public cloud and they're putting all their data processing in a private cloud and they need to tie it together because they do evaluation of the imagery of what to be able to see what kind of um, trends are taking place with their customer base here. And then that, that's, we see that with our customers here. So 
I think it's not just the segmentation of ver the verticalization itself, but it is sub-application verticalization that we're seeing that even takes it further and lets people further advance what they're doing. And we will talk more about that. But let me just remind our audience that if you want to ask any questions, um, use our NAV tab on the right side of your screen, um, and we'll soon be kicking in with uh, the audience Q&A as well. Um, for now, let's talk about something that has been spoken about a lot, even before COVID as well, um, which is edge computing applications. I mean, this was hailed as the next big thing um, that, that's already been in the making for a while now, but how has COVID-19 forced the development um, of edge cloud applications? Um, Ryan, would you like to go on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so w as we talk to our different customers out there, you know, we have some specific verticals that we work within financial and, and healthcare and manufacturing. It, you start to see the need to get data faster, to make faster decisions, to have more of a realistic just-in-time manufacturing process, for example. Uh, manufacturing is really where I've, I've seen the biggest conversation happening, um, along with uh, food retail, uh, grocery stores, things like that. But you're talking about, okay, we're starting to build product, um, but we need to do that analysis faster. We need to do it closer to the manufacturing plant. We need to be able to do um, materials uh, inventorying uh, against uh, demand requests happening in near real time. And having that edge compute, that edge capability is really going to drive for those industries. Uh, think of a grocery store. Uh, if they have, uh, they've done their inventory electronically as it's been received, and then they have the app pickups, they have uh, the in-store usage, you need to be able to process for an individual store closer to them and be able to get them the data faster to make decisions on reorder and, and things like that. So Edge is going to be uh, more and more of a viable conversation in those verticals without a doubt. It's about getting that experience closer to the customer because now we're starting to have an expectation as the consumer that things are happening faster. Uh, you know, everybody's doing everything remote. It used to be you drove across town and you could wait 20 minutes to get your groceries. And now you're starting to have some, kind of some changed expectations, right? I want things faster. I want my information faster. I need to get my groceries faster or, or whatever that, that may be. So that, that change in expectation is going to change the innovation that happens in the marketplace as well. Hmm. Now that's interesting. And I guess the, the speed in digital adoption and this is digitalization of services in our lives as well over the last 12 months definitely comes into line um, with what you just said. But um, Arish, again, I mean, Google, lots of points of presence, lots of different little things around the world. Um, what's your take on edge computing? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, uh, retail, manufacturing and energy industries are mostly where are facing this, this is growing demand. Um, to provide like you know uh, like specific localized consistent low latency services, um, and they want and they want them to be able to expose these compute services such as machine learning, uh, inferencing and predictions, data aggregation, or running their corporate software, right? So so when in my conversations they've they're actually designing their two to five year product and technology roadmaps. And, and they're also looking for like, you know, these platforms that can address basically three main concerns, which is like what I'm hearing is um, network inconsistency, ease of operations and cost efficiency. So that's the kind of platforms they're, they're, they're rapidly trying to deploy and use these services from the cloud at, at these different, uh, uh, you know, edge, edge locations. Hmm. And quick one, do you think the market is answering the edge demand correctly? Is there enough um, provision of infrastructure and services um, that you've seen, or we need to do it even faster, especially now? Yeah, I mean, we could always do better, <laughs> if I was to <laughs> say that. Uh, um, the demand's always there, uh, as and when we start, and, and just like all the you know past 30 minutes of discussion, it's just, if anything, it's just accelerated more and more with COVID. That's good. Ryan, would you like to add something there as well? <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think we're going to see... Um, faster and faster development with everything that's happening. I think people are trying to figure out what edge means to them and what kind of benefit it can bring to their organization. Um, and I think, you know, just to my comments earlier, that introspective look will help to realize that maybe building the bigger, faster monstrosity that's in your individual data center uh, isn't the answer. It's consuming services at the edge from an AWS, an Azure, a Google um, service providers like um, 
like us uh, at Envolta and, and others. It's it's about getting to that location where your customer base is and and being able to consume things that are more off the shelf um, from from a services standpoint without having to build everything yourself. And that's going to help people to understand too how to how to get closer to that edge use case. Hmm. No, that sounds good. And I mean. Edge is only one of the things that's happening um, in our marketplace. There's a lot of different and new technologies coming into place. Um, let's look into the future, even beyond COVID. COVID is going to speed everything up, but what's next? I mean, there's a lot of things that we're seeing coming out that will effectively, effectively transform, once again, the hybrid cloud application game. Um, I mean, you can talk about pretty much anything here from serverless computing, opt automated cloud orchestration, cloud containers. There's so many things that we can pick up. So maybe let's go around and see what everyone thinks. Joel, I'm going to put you on the spot and get you to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about the, uh, you know, the forced digitization that the pandemic has, has uh, you know, certain industries, certain companies have been forced into, you know, cloud-based, very uh, flexible environments. There's another path here that is less directly impacted by the pandemic, but that we're seeing as well that, that speaks to the future. And it's about you know, these waves of change. Uh, we see a lot of clients now who are very focused on infrastructure right now, like just get my virtual machines from the data center to the cloud or get me out of the data center altogether. So a lot of data center takeout type of work. How can I reduce and manage costs long term getting out of the data center? What are the tools and technologies that are evolving? And, and you mentioned serverless, microservices, there are certain things out there that enable you to rethink how your applications are built to prepare them for a, a hybrid cloud, multi-cloud type environment. And so we're seeing a lot of that as a phase two, once I've sorted out my infrastructure costs. And then lastly, what are the new things I can do? And I think what you're gonna see a lot more is things around uh, tapping into machine learning, for example. Uh, when you've got a, a strictly on-prem environment, it's hard to, to tap into everything going on in the MLAI world. As soon as you've moved to a multi or hybrid cloud environment, I can now start to tap into those types of services. So I think you're going to be able to see once I've sorted out my infrastructure and got my costs under control, I've modernized my applications, I've put them in containers, I'm running in you know, one or more cloud environments. It's the next wave is going to be the value drivers that come out of that. You, you, we cut the costs. Now, what are all the values? And I think in particular, ML and AI are going to be a component of that. But it's really going to give you a chance as well to reevaluate your entire digital experience. And so that, that come, that's where the intersection of forced digitization and this longer term digitization are all going to come together. And that once I have implemented all this and I have these cloud enabled worlds and flexibility at my fingertips, what are going to be the high value you know, business disruptions that are going to be coming out of it? And then from a cloud provider standpoint, as we march up that vertical ladder I talked about, what are the types of services that are going to be specific to industries, even specific to companies? So I talked about that ML AI wave. It's not just going to be about generic machine learning models. It's going to be about industry specific or even client specific and customer specific machine learning models that I can now very quickly make use of and turn the crank on because I've evolved into these new environments. So like I said, I think it's going to be core infrastructure to modernizing, containerizing, flexible applications to then the next big ideas powered by those the changes that came before. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, this is really going to transform the way we do business. Um, we're almost running out of time, but Ryan, would you like to just add some last few words on that question? <clears throat> sure. The, the thing that I see a massive shift in is going to be uh, connectivity. Um, we're doing more and more connectivity. It used to be, you know, T1s and, and DS3s and things like that. That that was all great. And then you got into gig connectivity. But we're starting to get to the point where you can't drag fiber. Um, you know, there's, you know, balloons that were used for connectivity. There's going to be 5G wireless. That connectivity footprint's going to have to change and shift and grow faster because we can't just keep burying cable uh, across the country to get to get to the connectivity place that we need for all businesses to be successful and to be able to consume those cloud services and edge use cases and things like that. You know, I'm from, I'm from Iowa. We're not exactly the Mecca of connectivity uh, like you might find on the East and West coast. Um, but we still have many businesses that need to be serviced and, and have needs within our, our spaces and, and connectivity dragging, dragging fiber across the state of Iowa uh, will take years and years and years. So how do we shift and, uh, and adapt that communication that connectivity, low orbital satellite, um, 5G wireless, things like that are going to be pretty big shifts, um, I think, in the next couple of years. Okay, Ryan, thank you so much. I mean, I've got a lot of follow-up questions, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for th today. 
Um, thank you so much, you guys, for joining us today. And on behalf of our panelists, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in and for participating in today's roundtable. Just a bit reminded that our speakers are staying for the remainder of the lunch hour um, to answer any more of your questions and meet them back at Networking Lounge at the table. Um, and to you, our viewers, if you are one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one, which takes place on April the 15th, where leaders in our industry will talk about shaking down the digital divide, rural broadband access across America. And as a wrap from us, look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and many more other places. In the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge and happy networking. Thank you.